Ray, although you certainly do not believe in God, you're also uh, not pleased to see evolutionary psychology, uh, explanations about human behavior being derived from evolutionary theory as being total uh, explanations, whether that means there's a, a God spot in the temporal lobe of, the, uh, of, of our brains or uh, uh, we are uh, agents that are looking for uh, um, activity in the in, in the in, in the uh, bushes that we're worried about, so we get um, uh, anxious to invent spirits that aren't there, and these kinds of theories to where our ideas uh, of uh, religion come from. I mean, evolutionary theorists often say that religion has a social benefit; it brings people together, brings the tribes together, and so on. That may be the case, although looking at the history of religion, it's probably caused more conflict than unity even within tribes, never mind between tribes. But I have particular exception to the notion that neural activity in a particular place could be associated with some kind of sense of a transcendent source of the universe. Even less do I believe that can then somehow in the brain be translated into a meta metaphysical view of the world, even less to complex doctrines. I mean, there isn't a Council of Trent Center in the brain, for example. <laughs> you know, 15 years of argument isn't, as it were, incorporated in a few neurons. So the idea that the notion of God is an intracerebral <laughs> discharge uh, doesn't seem to me to take account of the cultural reality, the historical reality, the collective reality of religions and all their consequences. And the argument that I would make if I were in my uh, neuroscience uh, uh, doctoral program once again is that all of the things you talk about in terms of cultural relevance are certainly real, um, but, but they all have to be translated into neural activity in our brain. How else would we be able to deal with it? It's not out there in the world that affects us. It has to be incorporated with some sort of an encoding mechanism in our cortex. Well, I'm totally with Meloponti on this. As far as I'm concerned, of course the brain is a necessary condition for all these things. So if you chop my head off, my IQ falls, and my interest in God also disappears somewhat. <laughs> but that doesn't mean to say it's a sufficient condition or that, as it were, we remain inside our brains. The extraordinary thing is that perception transcends the body. I'm aware of things outside of myself. You're and aware of them, but you're aware of it by mechanisms of something in yourself. Well, ultimately, that's the final common pathway. And again, chop my head off and I'm not aware of a world around me. But that's only the starting point. We then have joining of attention. We then build up an extraordinary community of minds that has massive temporal depth, that has boundless geography and so on. And that's what we are tapping into when we are taking part in religious ceremonies or indeed declaring ourselves to be an atheist. It's that community of minds built up out of a trillion cognitive handshakes over hundreds of thousands of years. And that's where we should be looking for religion. And your analysis of this, I find absolutely fascinating because you are not defending the reality of God because that contradicts your own belief system. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what you're doing is you're taking all of the human higher level perceptions and saying that it doesn't matter whether it's believing in God or believing there's no God. Both are beliefs that have, that have uh, 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 characteristics different than what can be described by pure neural activity. So you're defending a, an independent sense of God, not because you think there's a God, but because you're, you're looking at the underlying human mechanism by which that belief or that value is, exists. Absolutely. It's, I mean, it, it's pointless looking into the darkness inside the skull, hope to find religious belief, Council of Trent, all the history of religion and all that it means and so on and so forth. And I think it's insulting to humanity to result, to reduce uh, religion, say, to something equivalent to what happens in other primate brains and so on. As a secular humanist, I think it behoves me to take religion very seriously. If you're a humanist, it's very odd to disregard or regard as merely a cerebral tingle uh, something that's been so important for good or for ill in the fashioning of humanity. So, so this really uh, bespeaks not to the nature of religion itself, but to the, from your perspective, the nature of what uh, human existence is. Yeah. 
Um, and so what more can we say other than there's this this disjunction between a, a purely physiological description of belief in God or belief in no God uh, and, and what you would think is a deeper reality. I don't know how to make progress. I don't think I do, and I'm pretty sure nobody else at the moment does. <laughs> I, I think really deep thinkers at the moment say we're going to have to kiss goodbye to a lot of our conceptual frameworks before we can even begin to understand exactly how my thoughts relate to my cerebral activity, how uh, it comes that I am totally different in terms of my ontological status from a pebble. We've got to start breaking down all the assumptions that have proved to be barriers to thinking about this at the right sort of level. And, and these barriers are on all sides there, um, whether it's uh, a purely scientific explanation of the world or whether it's God did it all and we're beholden to, to God. Uh, you know, you reject all of these traditional um, um, uh, uh, kind of epistemologies or ways of knowing reality. Yeah. I wish I was 20 rather than 70 because I think we've reached the most exciting time, I think, in human intellectual history. We haven't completely shaken off supernatural explanations and all the things that come from them. We're just about, courtesy of some thinkers, getting rid of naturalistic explanations. We're sooner or later going to start looking at actually what we are. And this is a story that's just beginning. And it is going to require attacking some of our most cherished ideas. There's a good example of this in science. If you think in 1900, black body radiation, hmm, bit of a puzzle, let's mm. sort of gloss it over, mm. but they didn't. And the result was quantum mechanics and all the technology that in fact dominates us in this a century later. And I think the mind-body problem or the question of the place of the mind in the cosmos is our black body radiation. This is our chance to actually question all the standard, the classical mm. understanding of the world. And you believe that in order to make progress, if progress be possible, the first step is, uh, is, is a, an, a critique and indeed perhaps a rejection of each of these other, all of these traditional methods of knowing, uh, at, at least re rejecting their, um, uh, their sense of, uh, of uh, omnipotence in being able to describe the world. The, the, the sort of cognitive closure that comes either from the religious world picture or the scientific world picture, if we set aside those, then we're going to free ourselves to really think about what kind of creatures we are, to really be astonished at ourselves. And I think astonishment should be the first step, just to look at the sheer complexity of getting up in the morning, putting on your clothes, and I've, do, I've done that in lots of books, but <laughs> it seems to me that if we don't start from there, from the phenomenology of everyday life, then we really will fail to see what the questions are, never mind what the answers are.